Okay, guys. Once again, Jeff Benson from Jacksonville, Florida for Victor Builders Risk. What we're going to do, this is another webinar in our ongoing series of taking a, and I'd like to call it an educational dive into, into Builders Risk. Today, we will dissect our own proprietary form a little bit, uh, but I think this will give you a good background in Builders Risk and you can apply it to any form out there. Uh, I will say this, keep in mind, all the forms are different. We, we have our own proprietary form. It has a little ISO language, a little AEIS language. Probably over the years have borrowed other coverages from other carriers to make it our own form. And so I've seen a lot of different forms out there. And that's all I'm gonna say is, these are the things, what we talk about today, you need to take a good look at the products that you're selling because they are very, very, uh, very different. They're not all the same. And sometimes one word, can make all the difference in the world and and or things like that. So it'd be the difference in an uncovered claim. So that's why we're gonna take a deep dive on this today. Uh, so what we're gonna do is run through this over the next few minutes and then we'll open it up for a Q&A and ask any questions about builder's risk. Uh, you can ask questions about anything you want at the end, uh, but we try to stick, to stick to the topic of the builder's risk. Beginning and the end, the builder's risk tale. So I thought about what we go through as underwriters on a daily basis and the questions that we get and some of these things everything every coverage i give you today and every line we talk about in the form i'm going to give you a real life example of something that happened uh, unfortunately maybe it was an uncovered claim uh, sometimes it was just uh, just the opposite uh, because you understood the coverage it was explained properly the claim was covered the insured was happy so we'll give you some positive and negative things that have happened on these coverages, real life examples. So let's go ahead and get started. So what we're gonna do, when you start with builder's risk, one of the first things you gotta think about is, I'll do this, is what is covered on a builder's risk policy. And this is part of the policy, I'm not gonna read it all to you. Keep in mind, all these are recorded. If you wanna go back and look at it, you can. This is right off our form. So the bottom line is, what is covered? So. If you think about it, the way I look at it is everything that's on that job site is covered on a builder's risk policy. So we know all the materials that go into the project are covered. The one thing people seem to forget about a lot of times though is when you calculate completed value builder's risk, it's really the completed value of the project. So all the labor that goes into the project is also covered. So you have labor, you have materials, and you have overhead. Those three things are automatically covered in this form. The fourth one is profit. So profit can be covered if they write the policy for the right amount. So those are the mandatory coverages. We have all kinds of other endorsements we can add. We're not gonna get into that today. Uh, we'll probably have, that'll save that for another webinar. We'll get into delay and completion and some of the optional coverages, flood and quake and some of that stuff. But today the main coverage form, labor, materials, overhead and profit. You can see has also the other parts of the coverage that people forget about or maybe the things that are all around the structure, the curbing, the paving, the fences, uh, you know, the trees and shrubs. I have one funny story, not really funny, but we had a builder building a house in Tennessee and he had the sod delivered and somebody stole the sod. So he had to pay to have the sod replaced. Well, somebody stole the sod three times. So finally we said, we gotta do something about this because I think you're, put, you're providing sod for the county you're building in and not for our project. So things do happen to these things. Uh, foundations, we're gonna talk about that in a minute too. The foundation is part of the structure and it is covered. So all of these things are part of the covered property. All right, let me see, we go back here real quick, hang with me. So how does covered property affect when coverage begins? Let's think about the typical job site. What is the first thing that happens on a job site? So I'd like to say the first thing that's gonna happen is the lot's gonna be cleared. Now, sometimes the whole subdivision is cleared by a, land, by a developer and our, our custom builder comes in later. The lot's already been cleared, but usually even our custom builder has to do some site work. So you think, all right, well, what's, what, does that move, what does that matter in builder's risk? Well, remember what I said earlier about labor? Labor is covered so i could say theoretically you have to pay someone to sit on that front end loader and clear the lot so that is part of the project it's part of the price of the project and it is covered so there actually is some coverage when they're even doing the beginning of the site work 
But then the other thing is what property is exposed when a project starts? Well, if you've ever been to a development where they're building single family homes, you'll have the rough plumbing that's put in. Maybe the main plumbing has already been put in, but now our builder has to go and have the rough plumbing put in underground and tie into that main plumbing. Things can happen to that, and I'll give you some claim examples in a minute. So these are the things, I guess what I'm saying is this project start, that's when the project starts, and it's always the best time to, to, to start your policy if you can during this time. That way there's no gap in coverage. When does coverage begin? So now we know what's covered, when does the coverage begin? So you can see on this the effective date of the policy, but it's uh, the whole key to this whole statement is legally liable. So when is your insured legally liable for the property that's on that job site? So you got to think about that. Now, sometimes about two thirds of what we do, we write builder's risk in the name of the builder, contractor, and about one third of the time it's the name of the owner. From a builder's risk standpoint, we don't care. It's just, are you legally liable for that property? Do you have a, a financial interest in the property? So whether you're a contractor or an owner is irrelevant. As an agent, you know, I'm looking at this, I want to make sure that my insured's protected. So if my insured's the builder, I would prefer to write a policy in the builder's name. I can always add the owner as an additional insured. And then I know whatever financial interest, whatever legally liable, liable property that I have is covered for my insured. I get asked this question all the time. Well, they're just going to pour the slab. Well, I've already walked you through a little bit on this. So it could be plumbing. We had a situation where the lot was cleared. Our builder had a bunch of uh, pipes delivered, plumbing uh, fixtures delivered, just the rough plumbing. And it was Friday afternoon and they said, well, it's Miller time, we'll come back Monday and we'll finish up, we'll finish this up. Well, they came back Monday and you, you can guess what happened. There was no pipes. So the pipes mysteriously disappeared. So, so even the rough plumbing, something can happen to it. On the foundation side, now we don't include earth movement or earthquake automatically, you have to add that. But I have seen slabs that have been vandalized. You know, maybe they poured the slab and some kids decided to have fun with it. And, they damaged the property so it was vandalized. That could cost a lot of money. So the slab is covered. Uh, it's a covered piece of property. So if you don't have the coverage in place yet, no coverage. Same thing with this rough plumbing. I just wanted to show you that. It's a good picture that the Jack put in there. But uh, you got underground plumbing, you don't think about it. What's going to happen to that? Well, maybe nothing's going to happen once it's in the ground. But before it gets in the ground, things can happen to it. People do steal it. And there is a value to it. Why does it matter when the project started? Like I've had questions, I've had agents ask me that. Well, our internal guideline, and this is an internal guideline, but it's actually in the form that is, if the structure is over 30% complete and you bring it to us to insure it, uh, we might not insure it. Or if we do insure it, we might charge a higher rate because it's already 30% complete. Uh, if it's more than 30% complete and you don't tell us, I could actually void coverage. Because keep in mind, this is what's called a completed value builder's risk. The, the, way, the reason the rates are so low is we write this at the very beginning when the project starts. So there's not a lot at risk in the beginning. So that's why the rate's low. And the, the exposure for the carrier, the risk taker, builds as the project goes along. So if you bring in something that's you know, 60, 70, 80% complete, you know, we have not, we've, we've lost that, uh, that, that ability to write the exposure. You know, we have all the exposure at once. So just that's why it matters when it was started. So we have to know that, we have to determine that. Make sure you tell the underwriter, yes, this is when it started because you don't want to have any problems with any avoided coverage. So now you got a feel for what's covered on the form. You have a feel for when it starts, so when you should get the coverage in place. Now, a lot of times before we get into the coverage ceases, a lot of times it's driven by the closing. So yeah, I need a policy for the closing, everything's fine. So just keep in mind it's not always done that way. And in today's world, a lot of times we see uh, we see projects that were not financed. And so there really wasn't a closing per se. There was no lending institution demanding the coverage. So those are the ones that sometimes what happens is the builder comes to us and says, well, I thought the owner was going to get the coverage. And the owner says, well, wait a second. I thought the builder was going to get the coverage. And neither one of them got the coverage. So now you have a million dollar home, let's say sitting there 90% complete with no coverage. So getting this thing off on the right foot in the beginning is very, very important. So keep that in mind, that's when coverage begins. 
these are the things we get the most questions on every day, multiple questions people don't understand. And this is where you really have to dissect the form that you're selling, the carrier that you're doing business with. I've seen dramatic differences in this one section of the policy. I won't pick on any of my competitors. All I'm going to say is there's some extremely uh, hollow forms. I just like to say hollow. So, but our form is pretty good. So we're going to go through our form. Some of the first, the first three or four are very self-explanatory. Uh, policy expires. No coverage after that. Okay? Remember, this is not a long tail coverage. This is property in the marine. But once that policy expires, coverage is done. Uh, coverage property is accepted by the purchaser. That's usually when you close on the on the project at the end, purchaser accepts it. I'm not legally liable for it. I don't have any financial interest. I'm done. Uh, that's the same thing. The interest in the property ceases. It's usually at the closing. You abandon the construction with no intention to complete it. I do find that interesting. So what we're seeing now because of the COVID crisis is a lot of delayed projects. I talked about this last webinar. I will say this. So you you know. Some adjuster might say, well, they abandoned the, the project because uh, they didn't, but we're not treating it that way. I don't think any carrier would be in the COVID crisis. Uh, so we're gonna say, if you've had to shut down the project, there's still coverage in place. We just wanna make sure that you check on the project. So we're encouraging our builders to at least go by the project and check on it. Uh, so then it's not abandoned. You do have an, you are uh, planning on finishing the project. So this is the next one. Number five is the one we're going to spend a few minutes on. So we have a 90-day occupancy clause. That's built into the AEIS form. Some companies have it, some don't, but that's a good 90 days is good. So that means you build a house, they can go ahead and move into it for 90 days, you still have coverage, except a couple of these kickers here. So in our form, we say if it's used as a model home, we understand that as long as you told us it's a model home, so it can be occupied and still have coverage in place. Our form says if it's a single family dwelling and it's being remodeled, it can go ahead and be occupied. That's okay. Uh, used as a model home lease back. We don't see that as much anymore, but some larger builders will make a deal and lease the home back to someone so it's occupied, but the builder still owns the home. As long as you tell us what it is, that would be covered. Uh, once you, uh, when it says the property is leased or rented to others, that is a kicker. You need to understand that. So if it's a single family, once that builder accepts rent on that structure, it becomes a rental dwelling, coverage would cease on our builders this form. So they cannot accept rent on these structures. Sometimes they will let the family move in, the closing scheduled 60, 90 days, there might still be coverage. But do not accept rent on that because once you accept rent, now you've made it a rental dwelling and that's another exposure. The other thing is we build, we, we see a lot of the, uh, we'll call it quadruplexes, which is deal with the four family dwellings. So our form says, if there's 50% occupied, obviously two out of the four, you still have coverage. Once that third unit becomes occupied, coverage ceases. At that point, you need to get permanent insurance on that quadruplex. Either that or you need to work a deal with the carrier and we have to amend the policy. So just keep that in mind. Uh, here's the one that we get a lot of questions on, on commercial structures. We have a builder that's building a strip center and there's going to be uh, 10 different tenants in there, maybe a, I don't even know, whatever, Starbucks and the Dunkin' Donuts and whatever else is going to be in the strip center. Our form is still, coverage would still be in place up to 75% of the square footage being leased out. Once it's more than 75%, you got to come to us. We need to, you got to add occupancy clause or you got to find permanent coverage for it at that point. So it's 75%, which is a pretty good deal. And it's because permission to occupy is a pretty expensive coverage to buy. Uh, so just keep that in mind. And then the last one is this pre-lease established prior to construction. So if you have a pre-lease, that doesn't count. That's okay. We understand that. So these this is really critical that you understand when coverage ceases. Because let's say, because as I said earlier, in builder's risk, you have very little exposure in the beginning and all the exposure at the end of a project. So near the end of the project, you could have you know, millions of dollars of property sitting there and it violates one of these conditions and uh, you have no coverage. So this is what we wanna avoid. That's why I'm spending time on this today. These are questions. I have a completed, I have a completed a ground up new residential structure and now it's for sale. What do I gotta do? Okay, you gotta, first of all, you gotta make sure you have the policy in place. It has not expired. 
So the policy is not expired on our form, as long as it's not, you know, occupied and it's uh, being held for sale, you still have coverage. Okay, but now once the policy gets near the expiration point, you're going to have to contact us. We're going to have to either write a new policy or extend the existing policy. And that's critical. You cannot let it you know, go past the expiration. You could have a brand new home, nice home sitting there with no coverage. So keep that in mind. Now, we do send out emails on ground up new construction as a reminder saying, do you still want the coverage or not? But I, if I was an agent, I would probably diary it myself to make sure uh, that we extend the coverage. Because uh, we do have a lot of the, uh, there are spec homes being built and there are, some of these are very high valued homes. So let's make sure we have the coverage in place. This is a critical piece of the remodeling. About a third of what we do is remodeling. So I completed the remodeling project, the work has stopped, uh, but I haven't sold it yet. This is maybe I bought a structure with the intent of remodeling and reselling it. Uh, under our form, on the remodeling form, if more than 60 days goes by without construction activities, coverage is reduced dramatically. That's just built into our form. Because we don't, uh, this is not a program for vacant property. There's other products that insure vacant property. We insure ongoing construction projects. So the way we protect ourselves is that 60 day rule. So if you have a remodeling project, make sure there's still construction activity going on. If not, you might have to find vacant property coverage. Once again, this is just because we get this question a lot on the quadruplexes. Two units can be leased or rented out and occupied, that's okay. Once the third unit's leased, leased or coverage ceases once that third unit is done. So it's 50%, that's the rule. That was kind of it as far as we covered covered property, what's covered on a builder's form. We covered when coverage ceases, I mean, when coverage begins, when you should get the policy and, and make it you know, effective. And now you know when the coverage ends. So keep in mind on the coverage ends, there's lots of things we can do to extend that coverage. The key to all this, as always, is calling and talking to your underwriter. We're here to talk to you. We want to help you out as much as we can. So it was kind of that was our webinar for today. Just in a couple of weeks, we're going to have another one and we're going to talk about policy conditions. Uh, there's a lot of information in the policy conditions that we kind of overlook. So we're going to kind of dissect that. And I've found a lot of differences in the different carriers as far as their conditions. So that's kind of, the, once again, the key to the whole thing to understand the valuation clause and cancellation clauses and things like that. So we will get into that in a couple of weeks. So what I'd like to do now is open it up to questions. Do you have any questions uh, relative to builder's risk? Uh, covered property, coverage begins, coverage ends. Uh, let's see what we got. All right, Jeff, we've got some questions already. So Good. first question, referring back to when coverage begins, what about during transit? Good question. So uh, transit coverage. Under our form, we build in transit coverage automatically. You get a half a million dollars automatic. You don't have to ask for it. You need more than that, you got to come to us. That's a pretty good deal. So um, I could, you could say in the very beginning, maybe you bought the window package and the trust package and you took possession of it. And now it's going to be, you know, you're going to deliver it somewhere. Uh, that would be coverage. You should have coverage in place for that. Because if you don't have the coverage, obviously no coverage. So you, if you have any property that is, if you know it's not covered property is what is installed or meant to be installed, what is meant to be permanently attached or on the structure is all covered. So maybe the trust is a good example. So good question. Another reason to have the coverage in place. Same thing with temporarily stored at another location. We have a half a million dollars automatically built into our form. So maybe they made the deal on the trusses. Uh, they're not ready for it at the job site, so they're going to put it in a warehouse somewhere, but they still are legally liable for it. Our form would cover that while it's temporarily stored at another location. So that does happen a lot. Good question. All right, next question. Does the vacant building policy also apply to E&O coverage for engineers and et cetera, or just the contractor? 
So first of all, like, keep in mind, I'm the builder's risk guy. I don't do vacant property, which is usually a, a whole nother ball game. It's usually a non-admitted, non-standard form. The vacant property is a property form. It doesn't include any GL. So I don't, it includes no professional liability either. So I guess the question is a little vague to me. So keep in mind, property's property, you know, general liability, and then you have this third wheel over here, which is professional liability, which is a whole nother ball game. So I don't know if I answered the question, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I did. All right, next question. What is the maximum value you can offer for a project? Okay, and there, are, and there are current program guidelines. If it's an inland risk, we can go to 25 million, uh, up to 25 million is our max limit. All right, does your builder's risk program include flood? I'm sorry, Darcy, I didn't catch that. Sorry, Jeff. Um, does your builder's risk program include flood? No, is flood, flood included? is included. So the, the, the major coverages that are not covered on the, on the coverage form, the main form, are flood and earthquake. Those are optional coverages that have to be added. Now, we do write flood and earthquake. You simply have to add those coverages. And uh, flood, we do write flood. It just depends. We're going to map the individual project, determine the flood zone. Uh, and that determines what limit we'll provide, what deductible we will offer, what rate we'll offer. Uh, and there are some parts of the country we'll, we'll, we will not write to flood, but that can vary. That varies by job site. So if you want flood coverage on anything we do, just give us a call. We'll, we'll help you out. Same thing with earthquake. All right. So. Are there no limitations for foundations and retaining walls? Well, no, well, there's no sublimit. You know, that's what I, the question I always think of is if there's a sublimit for, uh, uh, I've seen sublimits for landscaping, you know, only so much per bush or so much of this and that. We don't have a, a sublimit for that, but some carriers do. But as far as our form and the foundation, retaining walls, the basement, uh, there is no sublimit. It's fully covered. All right, next one. A remodeled home on the market is considered vacant and builder's risk policy would not cover the location, but a brand new home on the market is not considered vacant and would be covered for a builder's risk policy. Is that correct? Well, kinda, I guess it gets a little tricky. So if, if we write something from the beginning, it's a ground up new structure and we provided the coverage from day one. So now the structure is completed, it's pending closing, we can stay on that structure even though there's no construction activity. Remodeling existing structure is a whole nother animal. You brought it to us, you said, we're gonna be working on this. So you're working on it, then you stop working on it. So once you stop working on that, you have 60 days of inactivity before the coverage is diminished. Because we don't wanna be on vacant structures. Now we, we make an exception on the ground up new because we insured it from the beginning. What we see a lot of though, is you'll bring us a structure that's 100% done, it's been insured by somebody else, and now they're gonna renew it or extend it and charge more, and you want us to take it on, we're not gonna do that. Because we are, we wanna insure things from the beginning. So on ground up new from the beginning, we wanna be the carrier on it, and we'll keep extending it. On a remodeling, we wanna make sure that it is ongoing construction, not a vacant structure. So hopefully that clears it up a little bit. That's just our, philosophy. All right. Does the contract between the contractor and the owner or developer dictate who is responsible for what? Yeah, I don't get into evaluating contracts, but a lot of times that's exactly what it is. In the contract, uh, you know, the, the builder will, will stipulate that you as the owner are responsible for the, for the builder's risk. Personally, if I'm an agent and my client is a builder, I want to make I want to get the builder's risk because I want to make sure his interests are completely protected. So I would I would want to be involved in that process to protect my insured. Even if I'm the owner, the problem is let's say your client is the builder, but the, the owner is going to get the coverage. Uh, do you think he's got the right coverage for your builder? Maybe, maybe not. Don't know. Some pretty hollow forms out there. 
So yeah, but that is true sometimes. And another thing, I've talked to a lot of builders and I would say, if you wanna be considered a professional builder, I'd rather go to the owner and say, I'm gonna take care of the builder's risk. You don't have to worry about that. Obviously the premium is built into the cost of the, of the project, uh, but it kind of, it appears to be more of a professional builder if they're taking care of all the insurance. Good question. All right. So will delay and completion coverages apply to any delays from the current um, pandemic environment or delays? Ooh, that's 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 the hot hot item. First of all, delay and completion is an optional coverage. It's kind of like flood and earthquake. It's not built into the basic form. So we do have kind of a derivative of delay and completion, which is soft costs. We do build in 100,000 automatically into our form. And I would say there's no precedent on what's going on today. So I'm not going to even get into it. You know, I mean, I love giving you my opinion on all these things, but uh, it's just too too new. We'll have to see how it all uh, all washes out. Uh, but it is, I read all the same stuff you guys read every day that's coming out. Uh, and there's, it's gonna be interesting to follow over the next several months. How was that, Darcy, for a political answer? That sounded great, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. All right, so pertaining to um, the coverage thesis section, are you able to talk about larger multi-family construction units and where they're coming from in the leasing phases? Yes, so that has, if you write a, a larger multifamily, and that's really usually beyond our, our uh, appetite for our program, uh, you do need to work out with the, with the carrier. You know, if you're gonna just say you got 100 units out there and you're gonna start leasing them out, but it's still gonna be occupied, maybe you're still doing work on part of the project, you need to get an agreement with the carrier on the, the occupancy clause. You probably would have to add permission to occupy. Sometimes up to 100%, you know, we can do that, but the charge is gonna be substantial. Uh, habitational multifamily is a lot of exposure. You can imagine if you have a building and it's occupied, there's a lot of things that can happen to that. A lot of people plugging the microwaves in and you know, burning things down and stuff like that. So there's a lot of exposure. So you need to definitely work that out with the underwriter to make sure that the that the form is not going to exclude occupancy. You got to make sure it's covered. Good question. All right, looks like that's all the time we have today for questions. So if your question did not get answered, Jeff or someone from our builders risk team should be reaching out to you after the webinar. Fantastic. And there's our contact information. You can call me, email me anytime. Donna's available too. We're here to help you. I uh, look forward to doing business going forward and I'll talk to you in a few weeks. Have a great day.